so I'm Julie Greenberg, and um, I'm really happy to talk to all of you. Um, I'm glad Barbara, you know, sort of offered the opportunity. Um, what I'm doing is uh, serving as um, just sort of a, a person who is trying to make the learning curve for some voter protection at activities less steep. Um, not actually providing training, but just making it less steep. And these are voter protection opportunities in North Carolina. Uh, that's because North Carolina is a 31st Street swing left, you know, area of focus and has been for some time. It's a critically important state for a variety of reasons. Um, I'm not going to go into those. Many of you have already, you know, know that or have, you know, have an inkling of that from your just your basic, um, you know, sensitivity to the news. Um, and the voter protection that we're working on that I'm helping to sort of uh, provide an opening for is voter protection through the North Carolina Democratic Party. So there's all sorts of voter protection going on. Um, some partisan, some nonpartisan, some in the courts, some not, you know, there's all sorts. But this is voter protection being done by the Democratic Party. And it's all done under the um, auspices of the Biden campaign. So in fact, some of the signups have switched from North Carolina Democratic Party signups to Biden, you see a Biden Harris um, logo on. And that's all because it's all, you know, this is all a concerted unified effort. Um, basically there is um, on the ground voter protection and there is virtual voter protection. And it's all been scaled up very much more than it has ever been in any other election for a variety of reasons. Um, there is voter protection going on around an increased number of absentee ballots and the concern that people unfamiliar with absentee ballots might not complete them and that loses votes. There's concerns around the polling places um, that if we want people who do venture out of their homes to vote in person. And in, in um, North Carolina, there's a lot of voting in person because there's early voting beginning October 15th and continuing through October 31st. And then same day voting on November 3rd. So that's a lot of voting in person. And there is a concern that there be um, outside poll observers, and these can be people who are not lawyers, who basically can come from any state, doesn't have to be people who are registered in that county or in North Carolina in general, that they'd be there to sort of provide that physical presence in case a long line develops, in case you know machines break down, um, that somebody is there to report up the line and say, there's a problem at this poll and, and we need to get some, some attention uh, placed on this to fix a problem. So, um, that's what's going on, very big picture. And the slice, the very, just one little slice of it that I'm talking to um, uh, about with you today is actually trying to make calls to recruit people who are uh, likely to volunteer to do this, to come be poll observers. And these are people who in some way, shape or form the, the uh, North Carolina Democratic Party, um, uh, they indicated some interest in this. And the reason, you know, Barbara and I talked about, well, what would be the most useful um, uh, uh, sort of slice to talk about today? The reason we settled on this is twofold. First, it's a virtual activity, but it is one of the least technologically sort of intimidating uh, virtual activities. Some of you that have, may have tried to do some phone banking or something have, may have found out that there's automatic dialing now and you have to have this kind of, you know, uh, use this approach or that approach and, and it, it seems a little off-putting. So this is the least off-putting of all. And as sort of a bonus, if you, once you learn how to do this calling to recruit people to serve as poll observers, you are, have the same, you know the setup for another type of 
voter protection activity that's also important. And you can move into that very easily. And that other activity is uh, reaching out to people, same thing, making phone calls, and telling them that their ballot, they got an absentee ballot, they sent it in, and it was rejected. And they have to fix that in a way that you will be trained how to, how to tell them to do. That's called ballot curing. So this is a one-shot training on one slide. And we will go over, and, and it's not even training. I don't even want to slip to that. It's an orientation to training. You will be trained on this. You're not going to walk out of this session at the end of it and say, oh, I'm ready to do this, or you should feel ready to do it. No, this is so you get an orientation and know what the training will encompass, and you'll be all prepared for the training. Nothing will come as a surprise, hopefully. So I have to tell you, it, the, the pace of, of what is changing on the ground means that I might tell you something today and then about the script, what you say to people when you talk to them. And if you were to actually sign up to do this, say, Saturday, um, the script might have changed because conditions on the ground have changed. And they might be recruiting poll observers and people who are going to observe the absentee vote counting, which are called canvas observers. That might be both. So, you know, you have to, you have to be aware that things can change. But once you get used to this, it'll, 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 um, feel better. So before we actually go into some of the training, I'll share my screen and sort of show you what the materials are. Does anybody have any questions? Just sort of on the preliminaries. Barbara. If, is there any sense in talking to younger people we know and asking them to go down to North Carolina for any special day or anything? Um, I think if there are younger people available, who want to be poll observers, they, yeah, they, they should, can sign up in the same uh, sign up method that I actually don't have, I, I'll have, I'll add that to the um, materials that I provide to you, because it's not sort of in the materials I've sort of pulled up that I'm going to share my screen about. But yes, they can sign up. There is no need now for poll workers, the people who actually sit in the polls and help voters they have poll workers and that's really good news. That's, that's, you know, I know in maybe there are probably shortages still in some areas, but it's not a general shortage. The Democratic Party is no longer recruiting, or, and I don't think any group that I know of, that I've heard of is recruiting poll workers. So these are our observers outside. So any young person who's currently, you know, doing classes remotely and can move down to North Carolina and is, you know, not worried about being outside for, you know, when it's cold or rainy or whatever. Uh, yeah, they can sign up, go down and be a poll observer. I have to, they could do that. They could do that for two, from the 15th to the 31st. I mean, going to various where they were needed. The other thing I wanted to ask you, Julie, is um, are all the polls open? Like, in, you know, here in Maryland, there are just a few open. Like for early voting or, or for on election day? Or do you know what this system is, what they have? No, there? it's um, the early voting sites are, can be different than the November 3rd site. There are fewer. They tend to be larger, I believe. Um, the system has, and, and they change sometimes, so people have to consult. Uh, the a voter has to consult to make sure, but the information on early voting sites is very prominently posted on um, county websites that gives the hours of operation. Some of them have more weekend hours than others, depending on how rural or urban they are. But the system, this is not a new phenomenon in, you know, this early voting. This is a, uh, this North Carolina for all its voter suppression has had early voting for a long time. And it is actually the preferred method of voting by African Americans. Um, it's promoted very heavily because of the capacity for people to, if they've gotten married, if they've moved, they can change their registration on the spot and vote at the same time. There's just so many good things about it. And um, unlike, I don't know how many of you are Maryland uh, voters who are voting absentee, um, but in Maryland, if I choose not to use the absentee ballot, sitting on my kitchen table now, um, I have to vote, I can only vote provisionally um, in early voting or on November 3rd. 
in North Carolina, if there's an absentee ballot and people decide, oh, I don't want to get a witness, you know, that's just a pain. I don't, you know, I'm living by myself. I don't want to get a witness. Um, they can just set it aside and walk into early voting or same day voting and vote. And it's not provisional at all. It's counted, um, you know, immediately. It's not, they don't wait to ch confirm anything. Um, so it's a more forgiving system in many ways. Um, and, but on election day, are, are all the precinct polls open or do they yes. have uh, is, Well, I don't know day? about that. I mean, these are, they might be consolidating and because to make them safer. I, you know, a, a very small bu building previously used as a precinct poll is, is probably not going to be used again under yeah, COVID right. conditions. Okay. So all of that, uh, who knows about, but I, I think they've been established and the, everybody knows at this point where the polls are going to be. Thank you. Okay, so let me share my screen and um, we'll get started with what you should, should uh, what our orientation is going to lead us through. So can everybody see that this is the Team North Carolina Resources page? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is on uh, as the 31st Street dot org, and I'll send the link. Um, I'll, I'll send an email to Barbara can circulate with the way to find this if you don't know already. Um, this is a resource page for Team North Carolina, and it includes voter protection. And in the voter protection, you see recruiting calls and this introduction to North Carolina poll observer recruiting call. And that's what we're gonna go through today. Um, so I, there's other material here and after today's session, I will be posting right here under recruiting calls this a recording of this orientation. Now, when you open up that, here's what you'll see. This is what is posted. And I'll add some things to this. As I said, um, the sign up for if you want to recruit some young relative to go down to North Carolina. But um, this is the actual sign up for the training. Remember, this is an orientation. It's, it's, um, and the training, if you lose that link, this is where you would actually sign up for this activity that we're talking about today. Photo protection, phone bank. And you can see the next session on this is Saturday, October 3rd. So that's the first one that this group could sign up for. You could sign up as a group. You, and once you are signed up, and have learned, you are able to continue to do this um, on your own anytime you want. You could pick out an hour on a Wednesday afternoon and say, I'm gonna make some more calls to recruit poll workers. Or if you wanna keep doing it, Saturdays one to three. Yeah, I gotta tie your shoe, didn't stop. Uh, can people mute if you're not, uh, and we'll go to question and answer at the end, you can unmute. Okay, so, I don't know how many people there are on these calls now, this, I mean, the training sessions. It starts out as a Zoom and you would all see each other. Um, I don't know how many are on them, but hopefully you know, you would see a friendly face. Okay, so what are you gonna need for this? Um, you need a computer, laptop, or tablet. And there is a recommendation to have Chrome as your browser. I don't, I've used Firefox. I think Safari is a bit chancy, but Chrome and Firefox are probably fine. You need a cell phone or a landline, earbuds or headphones. And you will get a link to this open VPV. So once you get it, that's actually the database that has this list of Democratic voters, and you can bookmark it and come back to it, as I said, anytime you want. Obviously, I don't have that because I'm, I, you know, I, I'm not doing the training. That's what you get at the training. Okay, so here's the things that you want to do before you begin the training. And you will get an email before the training when you sign up on that website I showed you, that mobilized site, 
you would get an email that says these things, but I'm just giving this to you in advance, so you can just do it anytime you want. So first is to download Chrome, um, and the other is to get an action ID. Now, if you ever did any canvassing um, using minivans, some of you may remember putting in an action ID every time you logged in to minivan. Well, that's the ID you need. So if you never did this, you can just create one. Uh, you can go to the website that I've posted in that orientation and do it. And if you have an action ID, you vaguely, you remember vaguely, oh yes, yes, I do have that, but I cannot remember for the life of me what my password is. Um, you can create, you know, get a new password and there's no problem. So you do want to do that in advance. Okay, what else? <clears throat> you can also, this is optional, and if you, if you haven't already done it, perhaps for other reasons, put Google Voice onto your, you know, up, obtain a Google Voice number. It, it can be, it, it can then be uploaded, you can open the app on your phone for Google Voice, you can open it on your computer. What this allows you to do is to make calls to people in North Carolina in a way that they don't see your phone number, they see a North Carolina phone number you're going to pick. And you can pick a 919. Uh, 919 area codes are a North Carolina number and they're available. And um, here's what Google Voice looks like. Um, if you put it on, this is, it looks like this on your phone or on your um, device, of any other device. Um, this enables George, because I'm working on his desktop right now. This enables my husband, George, to use a keypad on the right to basically call to a number. And he is calling, you can see in the upper right, is 919-443-5698. That's what the number shows up as. Now, this is optional. If you are not somebody who you know really wants to fiddle with Google Voice, you do not have to do it at all. People, you're, you're going to make most times be leaving voicemails anyway, because as you know, you know most people don't pick up their phone. So when you leave a voicemail, you know it's not going to matter as much. Um, whether people pick up more when you have a 919 as opposed to a 202 or 301, who knows? But it, it's not something to um, to worry about excessively, I would say. Uh, and I put in a video of how to set up Google Voice. So it's really one of these things that is not that difficult to do. Okay, um, let's take a little break right now and see if there's any questions before we talk about the script, the actual calling. Any questions about sort of the setup, what you do in advance, that kind of thing. Barbara. And yeah, I'm mute. Make sure you. <laughs> there are two people who can't get in. They said well, the link isn't working for them, or or one is waiting for hosts to let them in. No, I, everybody's in now. There was a minute where I, 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 there, I was. I was. I was one of those. Okay. okay All right. In. Everyone's in. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. I have some um, questions. I installed Chrome. Safari is my default browser. When, how do I, do I make Chrome my default browser when I do this or how do I manage, because now I have these two browsers? Well, if you go, no, I, I think it'll be fine if you just open Chrome when you are logging into the Zoom and just stay in Chrome. The next time you open, uh, you, you know, you, you, you boot up your computer, it will go to, your default Safari. There, there, there is also a setting bar and preferences where you can make it your default because I had to do that. Okay. Oh, yeah. But I also think you can do it just, you know, selectively, but probably, you know, for the, for the time, just so you don't worry about it, probably best to just make it your default. Uh, Isabel. Yeah, I think you're muted. If, if you're not doing uh, Google Voice and you're using your cell phone, so in, in that case, um, they, can, they have your phone number that yes. people are calling. Yes. 
Okay. I have not heard, frankly, of any problems with this. Yeah. Remember, you are calling not only Democrats, but people that have, um, Democrats that have given some indication that they are open to volunteering. Right. And the chances that you're going to, your number is going to land into hands where someone is going to call you back with an abusive phone call or something, it's very small. It's just, you know. I was just, just one. I was just wondering whether um, you're leaving a voicemail, let's say, and they have some just questions about the voicemail. Are they to call you back or do they call some other number? I think um, they are, one of the things you're doing is it, and you'll, you'll see in the, they actually, there actually is a text of a message to leave. One of the things that is, is provided to you on the session where you call in uh, for your training is here's your message. This is what you leave exactly. And um, I think it does address the issue of what they should do if they have more questions. And I don't think it's calling you back, but they could be changing that message periodically. But I'm sure they do not say, feel free to call me back if you have any questions. It says, right. you know, right. if you want to, if you have questions, go here or go here. Do, do you do you know if they if you're using Google Voice, can they call you back? Last week I was doing this in Wisconsin and somebody actually did call me back. Yes, they can call you back on your Google Voice number. Oh. But you can set your Google Voice to not essential. There I I haven't done this in terms of my Google Voice. I do have a number. But they you can sort of put it in a separate category where it's really you don't get notified of it or whatever does anybody has anybody done that with their google voice who can who can tell say more about this i know in the setup it actually goes through a process of of doing that in any case it's really sort of a uh you can sort of fence off those calls in a sense and not have them even uh you know, not a, you're not even aware of them. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what I think I've done. Uh, Connie, you had a question. Oh, I just know because I used to have to call, I, for my job, I had to call a lot of people a lot of the time. And a lot of times I'd leave these really lengthy messages and then there'd be a call that comes right back in and says, I've got a call from this number. And I'm like, did you, did you listen to my message? And you know, cause I was talk, talking to patients, they're no, and I'm like, okay, let me, so a lot of times people will just call back because they saw a number, and I don't know, you know, if, because is the message to sort of say, call another number to get more information? Uh, basically, it gives them some website where they should do their, there's a, uh, and we'll go through this in a minute in the script. Um, okay, because that might happen just as an FYI, yeah. you know. Yeah, I have to say a lot of people are doing these calls, and I do get a lot of emails that are great as feedback on, I just had this experience, I just had that experience. I haven't had anybody call me back or, you know, email me and say, oh my gosh, you know, I did this calling and now I'm, I've gotten three callbacks and it's, I didn't expect this and it's horrible. Yeah, I really haven't heard anything about callbacks. So it, it um, wouldn't bother me. Yeah, I just yeah. sort of saying for people. Yeah. Um, Chris. No, Julie, I'm sorry, I missed the first 10 minutes of the call. What, um, can you just give, what, what are we learning today? Because I've, I've been doing the voter protection hotline. We're, we're talking about something else, correct? Yeah, we're talking about the recruiting calls to get poll observers. Okay, thank you. Yeah, pretty soon you can, you know, hit a triple. You can do all, all this and ballot curing and, you know, be, be a star. Okay, so let's go back to look at the script now. Okay, now, as I said, this could change, but this is the best approximation I've been able to put together. I was thought, well, I should go back on and do another training um, before I come back so I could bring you the most recent information, but um, they didn't have a training until the third, as you saw, and so um, I couldn't. So this is my best approximation. Um, so they're asking if someone can be a poll observer and they give the shifts 
And you can see this is, uh, can you imagine they have, I think, 2,000 ships that they have to fill. Maybe, I saw that number somewhere. Just a lot of ships because they have so many days of early voting and then the, the um, uh, day of. And then they, you confirm the county they live in. And um, if, if things are the way they have been in the past, you will actually ask them to go to a site that confirms their availability and you can see they actually get into um, those shifts. So they're getting down to the specifics. Um, and then they have to sign up for poll observer training. And I think that, so they go and go one time, you know, Thing. So basically, you're conveying information that leads them into a real assignment at a real place at a real time. And then you also ask, um, though this may change, as I said, they may be asking at this point about these voting observers, because in every county, they want to have people observing the count of the absentee ballots that they start doing pretty soon, I think October 27th. Um, and whether they can be a hotline worker, if they're an attorney, can they be part of the legal boiler room? Um, they have a notes section and they tell you you don't have to set, uh, say the word, uh, script word for word. You'll be told whether or not to leave a message and I think you will be told to leave it. And then the text of the message will be provided to you. And as I, the text that I saw had both of these sites in it, um, they have bit.ly, very short links that you can read out about accessing the site to schedule themselves and to get training. Um, so they also have a description here that they'll provide you of the role of the poll observer. Um, as you can see, it's to alert the Democratic Party of long lines or voter intimidation. This is that county canvas monitor and it, oh, Oh, it's September 29th, so they, they've already started this. Um, County Boards of Election will meet to review submitted absentee ballots. Now, I haven't heard much about this, so maybe they only need one for the day or one for a certain time. It really has not been a big emphasis when I've seen information from the voter protection team. Um, and then this hotline volunteer, that's what Chris was just mentioning. He's been doing that and this boiler room attorney. So they give you that information. And then they also give you in the script um, some important dates. These are the dates we've already uh, talked about. Um, this is because in, in any conversation with voters, they may come up. And um, you know, this is not something you are telling the voter, but if the voter says, oh yeah, uh, by the way, you know, can you please tell me something? It's just so you're a little bit for or warned about that. Um, so that is basically the pre, what you do in advance. And then when you do the training, they will actually open the link. And actually I can show you something, just ignore the Pennsylvania, uh, uh, I'm going to share my screen again. We're going to go up and look at something that was provided that would just give you a mental picture of the um, what this calling system looks like. I'm just going to flip through this. Okay. They're going to give you a um, uh, link to open this page. You see this open VPV, tongue twister. Uh, you're going to put in your action ID. Remember the one you created in advance. Um, and this is what comes up on your screen when you start making calls. Basically, you have a, a voter first and last name, a voter phone number. You indicate whether you could reach them or not. 
and they have the script on the screen and you enter information when you can't reach them, you click one of these buttons and they, it, you can see there's an explanation here of the um, various answers that the pen, this is Pennsylvania. So, you know, I don't want to tell you it's exactly like this. Um, here's, you indicate whether they're open to something. Um, here's some notes. I, I don't, you're going to have many more screens that you can open in North Carolina, but this is what it looks like. Just to sort of, as I said, this is a desensitization. I didn't, I don't have a link to this in the materials I'm giving you because I don't want you to get confused between Pennsylvania and North Carolina. Pennsylvania is very much, much easier because they're recruiting poll workers only on November 3rd, no open voting days. And you take a full day shift not these three day or three hour periods. So that's the Pennsylvania intake is much easier than the North Carolina. North Carolina is much more ambitious, but that gives you a sense of what is this, well, what is my computer screen gonna look like? That's what it's gonna look like. Okay, so that concludes my pre-training orientation.